Hello everyone, welcome back from our really quick break. We're now on to session two, our round table on leading early career researchers on TikTok research. Now I must admit, I am still an early career researcher, just a little bit further along in a couple of years. But one of the greatest pleasures I've had in putting this program together is connecting with what we've lovingly now branded our triple A team, Alicia, Alex, and Andy. And when I say their research is outstanding and truly going to be the emergent leaders in their cohort, I genuinely mean it, not as lip service, just because they've agreed to be here with us. We're going to allow each of them to introduce themselves and also what they do. But before I do that, please allow me to give us a bit of scaffolding. So in our planning, having heard from our fireside guests from TikTok, Claire and Catherine, we know now they have a bit of a wish list for academic researchers. We also know now a bit about the insight as to how TikTok develops policy, guidelines, and investment into future research on young people. Now, as scholars, the research field is very wide. There are so many research questions we could also possibly ask. And so we've handpicked three different perspectives from micro to macro. We have Sing Yuri and Li Zhao from the micro, focusing specifically on families, diaspora, and migrants, i.e. looking at the user perspective. Andy is a founding member of TCRN, as well as a research fellow of the Center for the Digital Child. Alicia comes in at the meso angle, looking at platforms, specifically some of the social technical consequences and impacts on users. Alicia is also a founding member of TCRN and a research fellow with the Center. Last but not least, Alex takes us to the top overview looking at governance, policy, and regulation. Alex has recently joined us as one of the key regional leaders of TCRN, and we're soon going to be announcing that he's also one of the 2023 virtual interns joining us in our program for the year. So without further ado, allow me to open the session. Um, Andy, Alicia, and then Alex, could you give us a five-minute overview of your research? What is it that you do? What approaches do you take? How do you research TikTok and children? I guess I'll get it started. Thanks so much, Crystal, um, for the very generous introduction. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is uh, Andy Jal. I'm a research fellow at the ERC Center of Excellence for the Digital Child at Deakin University in Australia. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining this event today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respect to their past, present, um, and emerging. So um, my research in relation to uh, TikTok actually began with my um, um, very lucky, I think, involvement in a research project led by Crystal as a research assistant back in late uh, 2020 and early uh, 2021. So the project, which was called uh, COVID-19 Messaging and, and, and Youth Engagements on TikTok, Examine how young people on TikTok are engaging with um, COVID-19 related messages. And in the meantime, um, Crystal and I developed a side project looking at how Asian young TikTokers uh, engage with the platform to speak back against this very controversial um, 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 social media trend called Fox Eye Trend, which was back then trending across, I think, uh, a, a few social media platforms. And, and we were particularly interested in uh, examining how the audio visual affordances of the platform really enabled and shaped, but also restricted young people's creative activist practices. And the findings were recently published in this paper in, in this special issue edited by Jing and Crystal on social media plus society, which um, Crystal mentioned just now. Now in my other ongoing project, researching family media practices in the pandemic, TikTok was not a particular focus, but it became um, a sort of media context which characterized family life in lockdowns. So what I mean is, although TikTok was not there in the research questions, it was constantly referred to by um, our research participants who were all parents of children aged between four to 11 as an everyday site of uh, family togetherness, um, entertainment, um, but also um, uh, contestation. So particularly in a time when physical mobility was heavily uh, uh, restricted, so if I need to distinguish these two projects, I like to actually call the first one research on TikTok, whereas the second one research with TikTok. Mm -hmm. So in this second project, the research team looked at family media practices in seven countries, and I was focusing on particularly China. With the Chinese parents in the study, they really had 
a love-hate relationship with TikTok, or more specifically, its Chinese counterpart Douyin, as well as other short video um, platforms. On the one hand, lockdowns created a temporal gaps in families' daily rhythms, which were used to be filled by schooling, social activities, um, and other forms of events. So to fill these gaps for the children, short video platforms became a very handy tool. But at the same time, parents had all kinds of concerns and worries in relation to children's use of, of TikTok, including addiction and, and harmful content. And some parents had to manually screen TikTok content for their children and set up strict time limits for their use. The teenage mode, which is um, a, a nationwide mandatory anti-addiction system, quite similar to what we call parental controls in many other countries, made things even more complicated as parents can choose to turn on um, this mode um, 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 themselves, uh, which make things kind of, you know, a bit tricky as, you know, they kind of need to consider a lot of things. So in this sense, um, TikTok became a, a very important lens um, to understanding contextualized uh, parenting practices and cultures. And I realized that there's a session focusing on parenting and, and TikTok, which I really look forward to later. Um, so these are the two main projects which featured TikTok that I was involved in. And this year, um, we're starting a new project um, um, in the centre, uh, looking at particularly digital media in migrant families in Australia. And I'll be looking at Chinese Australian uh, families in Melbourne in particular, which I expect um, um, TikTok will become kind of um, a, a, a central space um, for discussion and conversations with parents as well. So um, that's me. I think I'll leave it here. Thank you. All right, well, moving from the, the micro to the, the miso. Hello, everyone. Um, to start off as well, I'll, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm, I'm meeting from the lands of the, the Yagara and Turbal people and acknowledge that sovereignty uh, was uh, never ceded, that I'm, I'm meeting you from unceded lands. Um, so uh, as in the wonderful introduction that Crystal provided, um, I'm a socio-technical researcher. So I'm really interested in the ways in which people shape technology and the ways in which technology then shapes society. And I think about this at all different levels. And so my entry point uh, to TikTok uh, wasn't originally from a youth perspective, but it came uh, it came about in 2019. There was a really cool EDM version of the Jurassic Park uh, song. And I was just like, where is this song? I want this remix in my own Spotify playlist. And I could not find it. And I uh, found that there were others who, who weren't able to within the platform uh, find this song and through some uh, broad searching uh, online uh, myself and my colleague uh, Dr Bondi K were able to find this uh, particular remix song in halfway through like a four-hour playlist um, on YouTube and in the comments it said uh, if you've come from TikTok looking for this uh, Bracky remix like this is it and I was like yes um, and so that led uh, myself and some colleagues down a path to think about the ways in which the particular feature the use this sound feature uh, shapes the platform culture and the way that it affords uh, users to be able to uh, attribute or to misattribute um, the creators of, of sounds uh, which we problematize as um, you know pretty important given that um, mimetic practices on TikTok uh, is, is one of the, the key drivers of the platform and the ways in which uh, oral memes uh, are utilized um, on the platform. So from that research, uh, I then uh, worked with Dr. Ariadna Matamores fernandez on a paper that a bit of research that looked at the ways in which people engage um, in harmful practices of harmful humor, uh, where we looked at the co-occurrence of hashtag coronavirus and hashtag funny comedy to explore the ways or to understand the ways in which that people were participating uh, in um, what they perceived to be as jokes or as memes, but were everyday forms of racism. Um, and we found that the use this sound feature featured heavily within these um, uh, forms of harmful humor, wherein people were taking, uh, they were participating in forms of digital yellow face uh, by taking the, the voices of uh, folks of Asian descent and, and creators, and then creating character to caricatures or participating in, in harmful trends. And Something that I'll touch on, I think, a little bit later on in this discussion in terms of methods, but something that came up when doing that research is that we found a lot of 
children under the age of 13 or visibly looked under the age of 13 participating in these forms of harmful humor now of course for ethical reasons we you know discarded those videos they're not part of the published research but anecdotally it, it very much raised um, interesting questions in the ways in which children participate uh, with or on the platform and those who are under the age of 13 where I kind of feel like there's a bit of a void that we know that they're there but we they're not meant to be there so we're not meant to talk about it or we're not meant to look at it so these really interesting uh, ethical ethical and methodological challenges for researchers. Um, lastly the the broad thing to to speak on um, or two things of saying then uh, I've, I've collaborated with some research that is in progress at the moment that explores using TikTok in the classroom as a forms to develop develop critical digital media literacies. Um, because being a short form video, there's lots of, there's a, like a, a layered approach to think about the different types of critical digital media Digital, critical digital media literacies that children can develop, such as uh, thinking critically about the specific features of the platform, the, um, thinking critically about the content that is being created or shown, thinking critically about the um, recommender system and algorithms more broadly, as well as thinking critically about the political economy of the, the platform, the business model, um, and the ways in which the platform exists uh, in a media ecology. Um, so, that's the direct research that I've done on TikTok, uh, but more broadly, uh, being a research fellow at the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for the Digital Child, uh, a project that I co-lead is called Speculating About My Digital Future. And, and part of this project is uh, myself and colleagues are running workshops with seven and eight-year-olds and asking them what types of features, values and ethics they want encoded within future digital technologies. And that includes um, applications as well, uh, which is generating some very interesting insights insights, as well as I work uh, closely with Professor Michael Deswani on a project called um, The Children's Internet or Towards a Better Children's Internet in 2035. And we're thinking more broadly about the concept of a children's internet. So we have things like children's literature and children's television, uh, which is regulated and has some guidelines around what quality content looks like. And through this project of the children's internet, we're thinking broadly about the ways in which you know, the internet's not designed for children, but children are present or, or there are particular markets developing where children are constructed as audiences. So how can we envision a future wherein those uh, types of digital products and services are created from uh, the best interest of children and encoding those values, ethics and features uh, that support them and their right to be online? I think I'll leave it there. All right. Hi, folks. My name is Alex Turvey. I'm really excited to be chatting with y'all. I'm a PhD student and researcher at Tulane University in New Orleans. So I'm definitely a long way away geographically from uh, my colleagues here that just spoke. Um, and right now, I want to share with you just a little bit of what I'm working on um, as far as some content analysis of TikTok platform policy as it relates to youth and children. So what got me interested in this is the reality that, you know, legal regulation always lags behind on the ground practices. So it's rarely capable of capturing these really nuanced dynamics and TikTok in particular, we all know, has some really unique affordances that make regulation and platform governance tricky at best. <laughs> so like content is repurposed and recontextualized by design. There's this really rapidly iterative viral cycle. There's a famously opaque algorithm. This stuff makes it hard. Um, now that said, platform policies are a place where values are constructed, they're expressed. Policies like this serve as you know, boundary objects that negotiate between different parties and their interests. So I'm coming at this with like two questions that I'm still working on now. And I'm gonna share what the questions are and like the background and, and just sort of some things I'm still wondering about in my time. Um, so first, what are the latent values and priorities that are encoded in community guidelines? And then the second question is how have these changed over time with regard to these values and priorities? So to do this, I've been looking at the most recent six iterations of the community guidelines for TikTok um, starting in January of 2020, um, which is just the time frame that I pulled from the Internet Archive Wayback Machine. Um, just zooming back, just like Alicia, I'm an STS researcher also, so I consider platforms as a socio-technical assemblage, you know, meaning they're part of like this uh, fluid network of social, technical, human, non-human actors, um, and you can analyze them as a unit that's bigger than the sum of its parts. Uh, so social networks love to make use of this word platform that has some semantic richness to it, I would say. It comes off as neutral and open and can be used to like eschew full responsibility. But I would argue that their credibility on this has sort of eroded over time. And part of that is because platforms are not neutral, right? 
there's humans behind the policies, there's humans behind uh, the infrastructure, the policies encode norms and values about community and sociality. Um, so community guidelines in particular, as opposed to like terms of service and prior privacy stuff, um, they're the documents they reference about upholding and rejecting values. They're the idealized version of the platform. And so as a social scientist, community guidelines are right in the sweet spot for me for understanding on online sociality because um, they outline the ideal experience. Platforms as a community, they, they show us they, you know, they show us how to interact with, you know, other people. This means that they're intended to be like the most approachable and user friendly and, you know, jargon free. Um, so I just want to share really briefly what I'm doing to answer those questions. Um, first of all, there's this like really spot on blog post that I love from when Elon Musk bought Twitter that talks about the content moderation speed run is what they call it, where, you know, every platform starts out with this idea that like, we're going to be the open platform for expression and stuff like that. And then they start to realize things like, oh, shoot, child sex abuse material, we're going to be open except for that. And then they realize, oh, shoot, I got a copyright strike now open except for those things. And it just sort of like balloons over time. Naturally, it happens to every, every platform, um, because it looks so simple until you dig in. So Looking at the, the January 2020 policy, it's really interesting because that set of community guidelines was 3,300 words. The most recent one they just released was just over 13,000 words. So it's like a 300% increase in size just as complexity gets added and, and, all, and just like specificity too. Um, so just a couple of things I've noticed so far that I think are really interesting, like the older versions are a lot more semantically complex. Um, so I've seen them try to, to make things more accessible in terms of reading ease and stuff like that. Um, quantitatively, I'm not gonna get into it. There's a million different ways you can analyze texts that I think are really interesting. Um, but stuff like n-grams where you can look at little patterns of multiple words or um, cosine similarity, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. Um, but this is where I'm at now. Uh, I'm starting to try to uncover values that are encoded in the text, which I'll do through emergent coding, sort of a grounded theory approach. Um, and I'm just gonna share three things that I'm still wondering about and leave it at that for my five minutes. Uh, so the first is they are pushing more and more towards specificity in some of these policies. And so I'm starting to think about like, does that work or is it a rabbit hole that you're gonna be chasing forever? So if you dig into specifics and you look at the, the new community guidelines, there's so many really, really granular things. Um, and I wonder where it stops because you can't plan for every use case, of course. And maybe it's more of a problem where you try to define things like what's moderate body exposure or what are port the right portions of body parts that can be shown and not shown, specific challenges that shouldn't be eligible for the 4U feed, stuff like that. I wonder, does that work? The other thing I'm wondering is um, there's so much talk about intention in these policies. And they acknowledge even it's a really hard thing to measure. So I just wonder how possible is it to reasonably assess intention um, with consistency? Like, is that even the right question, especially when you're thinking about um, automated moderation versus human? And then the last thing I'm thinking about, and this is actually sort of connected to a paper that Crystal and I are working on right now, um, is what about rules being derived from the bottom up? Um, so like, like I said, the legal and the platform regulation is just so tricky and it turns into this like patchwork system of trying to catch, um, catch all the cases that you wanna protect kids from. Um, but because of that, like the user community sort of enforces norms in its own way. And so I wonder, various platforms have tried this in different ways, but like, what does moderation look like or what does even um, community guidelines look like from the ground up and what would that look like? So anyway. I'm still working on this paper. I'm excited to hopefully share it soon. Um, but that's where I'm at. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Alex, Alicia, and Andy. You know, the quality of your work is so great that even in your introductions, there's already provocations for us to think about. I was really, really heartened to hear about this provocation from Andy on how we can think about contextualized parenting cultures. You know, when we do quantitative research on TikTok, we think a lot about methods like going through the parenting hashtag and then we need to make a lot of accommodations for how we embed that in that context. Similar to Alicia's work, we are looking at things like critical digital media literacies and then quality content, something that's so nuanced and hard to define, even as you move across formats. And with Alex's work, when you're looking at something from the bottom up, Sometimes these rules may be blanketly applied, but people still have ways on the grassroots level of either sidestepping them creatively or coming up with their own that they feel might be more useful. 
So given that you've issued us provocations, I'm going to put you in a bit of a spot and ask you to tell us how you have dealt with these challenges. So very briefly, in about three minutes per person, tell us a bit about one or two challenges you've had in your approach or your methodology and what you're doing to manage that as you study TikTok and children. Can I start? Sure. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Crystal. Um, so my approach so far towards um, researching TikTok <clears throat> has been purely qualitative um, with my first project. Um, looking at with that project, sorry, with the project looking at um, young TikTokers and digital activism, um, we basically um, uh, used the, uh, this qualitative content analysis of um, uh, TikTok videos that speak to the theme. Um, we used the search function on the platform um, um, to um, locate and collect TikTok videos that really speak um, about and against um, this fox eye trend. Uh, and then we conducted this detailed uh, audio, visual, and textual analysis of um, these videos, trying to figure out um, what these creators have done with these, um, um, you know, with their videos. What, how did they kind of apply, for example, the audio memes? Uh, how did they apply um, the filters that picks out what they want to achieve? Um, I guess it's 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 a convenient method um, for researching content on TikTok, but without uh, I think without um, um, for example qualitative data through uh, interviews with the creators we do have some uh, questions unanswered or we kind of design the, the the project to really answer some questions instead of others so I think it really um, um, it really needs kind of kind of more comprehensive approach if you want to really understand this phenomenon in a better way and that I would consider one of the challenges for that particular project um, and also you know thinking about interviewing these creators is also about building trust and report with them um, and making connections which will be kind of another challenge if we really go down that path um, with the other um, um, project the pandemic well so it's called pandemic parenting project across seven countries um, we use um, interviews mostly um, and also because of the time of the data collection which was still during lockdowns we use mostly um, um, or not mostly but purely online interviews on zoom and in my case on wechat with chinese parents now um, interviews are helpful of course and because at the time of the interviews um, you know there was still lockdown so parents really still remember clearly what they've done but um, um, because of the kind of uh, difficulty to really see what they were doing with um, screen media and digital uh, devices, it was really difficult to know what the context was for their, um, um, uh, you know, uh, what they were kind of thinking about screen media or when they were um, planning on these kind of restrictions on their children's use of screen devices and TikTok particularly. So I think um, they are, they were helpful. I'm really happy with these kind of approaches, but of course, um, they were kind of, um, uh, well, I guess that's with all kind of methods uh, to some extent, right? They all had their limitations. Um, so uh, in the next project, hopefully we can address some of those because um, on that migrant family project, we are really designing this project to be a mixed method, kind of, to use a mixed method approach where we're going to um, um, both surveying uh, 300, uh, well, up to, I guess, 300 migrant families, particularly parents, in Australia and then use a more case study kind of approach to do interviews and then um, potentially home visits if um, possible to really see what that context and environment is for using um, uh, media devices in the home. So yeah, um, that's me, I think I'll leave it here. Uh, so going next, um, I mean, uh, my my mind goes to the the big conundrum of um so i've the tiktok research the first two papers and the, those projects involved web scraping and the challenges of web scraping i feel is like multi-layered in terms of the complexities so firstly in that first instance of 
uh, um, not meant to, through the terms of service, technically not meant to be uh, <laughs> scraping TikTok data. But until you know the API, the the API for researchers, you know, is expanded to more countries and researchers are able to access it in those ways. Um, it, it's kind of that tension, that complexity that we kind of have to navigate. So there's that layer when it comes to uh, the act of web scraping and scraping that data. Also, web scraping is a really challenging type of method in the sense of it is so blunt in the ways in which it captures so much and so much unintended data, data that you don't want to have, and but data that you're then responsible for um, in, in making sure that that harms are, are, are mitigated against. And, and that's what I, I raised in that example of uh, the, the paper that I did with um, Ariadna metamores Fernandez and Patrick Wickstrom um, looking at um, harmful humor on TikTok. It, it wasn't our intention to seek out that the ways in which children would be participating in these forms of, um, you know, these harmful humor, but they were there. Um, and I think the challenges of, um, you know, wanting to... I think I hope you can pick up in the the aspect of my hesitation even talking about it that I, I think this is a very real thing about researchers is that here we are trying to in these types of methods look at the more macro trends of the ways in which users are participating on the platform um, and and gather insights from that perspective. I think it's a valid perspective, but to navigate it in both ethical and methodologically sound ways creates lots of challenges. And when we talk about it in the context of children, where as I said earlier. Children under the age of 13 are not meant to be on the platform, but they are on the platform. So what do we then do as researchers in the sense of whether we're doing research on TikTok that specifically is interested in exploring patterns or, or practices with children or not, you need to be aware that if you're using web scraping methods, you might be collecting children's data. And what does that mean in terms of how you store, use or erase that data um, to mitigate those risks? But then let's say if you are interested in understanding the ways that well, firstly, the presence of children under the age of 13 on the platform and the ways that they're participating on the platform. How do we create types of research uh, methodologies that is able to do that in both methodologically sound ways, but also ethical? Um, and when it comes to children's data, consent is the, the you know, most important thing. Um, but how do we obtain that consent when, let's say, there is, you know, like a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand videos um, to be going through, and I'm doing that classic thing where I don't have any answers for that. But I think that these are the things that need to be front of mind when we're thinking about um, using particular methods like web scraping when doing research around children and TikTok. I'll leave it there. And I'll jump in last, unless you were going to say something, Crystal. But um, I'll jump in. So uh, I, I guess I'll take this in two directions. One, talking about the project that I just shared about, and two, talking about some other research um, in terms of challenges. So thinking about the uh, platform policy and there, they, on uh, in terms of research on other platforms, there's like this established concept that um, ways that the first, the you know United States First Amendment uh, enters into platform community standards, um, not as like law and not necessarily in a direct way, but it sort of informs the ways that people think about the issues and view the world, et cetera. And so as an American researcher, like I have the context on that, right? Like this is the water that I'm swimming in, you know, I, I've lived in my whole life, but um, if I'm trying to understand platform context and policy for a different context, um, there's a lot of untangling that I have to do as a researcher and like reflexivity that has to happen in terms of like being aware of my own frame of reference and biases. Um, that's still a problem that I'm sort of untangling. I'm really happy to be a part of this research network because I do think like collaborating with folks from different contexts is, is really important. I think everybody here um, has already mentioned, you know, context specific research and the significance of that. Um, I know I'm talking about this from a macro perspective um, in, in relation to, to at least my colleagues here, but um, context is still super important. So that's one thing. Um, I, the other thing, I, I actually, before I go on, it's just like back to the socio-technical perspective. If you're gonna do that well, um, that means you have to understand political and social context and like, you know, how, they sh how we shape platforms and how that's circular, things like that. Um, the other end of things for me is I do a lot of work on 
TikTok and Instagram around negotiating identity and authenticity on these platforms um, and how identity is enacted, performed, and received. Um, and so that is tricky for a lot of reasons because you can't rely just on what people say about what they do. This is a classic problem with interviewing, of course, but um, you wanna understand what they actually do. And so one way I've started to work on that is through um, the walkthrough method. So not just in the traditional way where you're sort of as a researcher coming to, a, to a, an application or a platform or whatever blank and, and sort of exploring all the trees of like ways you could navigate the, the service, but also like in an observation way. So you know, coming at users and observing them, how they use it, things like that, um, I found to be a helpful way of, of sort of understanding from the other perspective beyond just what they say, how they navigate their own performance of identity. Mm. Thank you, Alex, Alicia, Andy. Again, so many good things for us to think about here. Um, the key thing that stands out to me is this idea of standpoints or standpoint theory again and again, whether it's from Andy telling us sometimes we need to learn to corroborate methods, if not within a project, then across projects, so you can do some comparative qualitative work. With Alicia, there's always this tension of the ethics of your method, knowing that that might be the only tool you have to study a thing that you really need. <laughs> And so that's a bit of a challenge. And then for Alex, that reflexivity around frame of references, even down to how you interpret a policy before you go on to study how users feel about that policy. So thanks for giving us that food for thought. Um, I want to be cheeky also and issue the same provocation I did with Catherine and Claire earlier in our last five minutes before we go on to Q&A. If you had a wish list, for TikTok, the staff members there, the company, um, for something that they could do or provide or furnish you with to make your research life just a little bit better, what would it be? Feel free to dream big. We will try and make it happen or negotiate or work together with our platform partners. <laughs> um, for me, um, I, think, I think what I really would like to see is and not, first of all, I'm not sure whether the company is doing that, all right, because I haven't um, take that. But I, I, I feel that there's some sort of lack of that effort or or, or mechanism because of my um, research on um, parenting and and TikTok. The fact that parents have so much anxiety, worry, and concern about their children's use of the platform, despite the fact, based on what Claire and um, Catherine ha have said just now, they've got so many mechanisms internally and externally to make sure that to make sure that children are, are protected and things like that but it seems to me that they lack the, the, the lacks this kind of communication or effective communication with parents because I think it's important to, to understand that in many countries children's use of media in general is not in their own hands it's in the hands of their parents so it is really important for parents in some way to know what is really happening with the platform and for the trust to be built between parents and these platforms or you know between parents and these mechanisms behind these platforms that really kind of are at work there so i really want to see more kind of um i guess communication in that space so parents are not left in this space that they just kept worrying um about you know what will happen to their children but they need to be really more confident um in that space i think through this kind of communication so that would be my um um, what I wish to happen, I guess. Okay, it's such a good question. <laughs> uh, so the thing that I'm thinking about is based on that really great fireside chat with um, Claire and Catherine and this raising the challenges around, for example, age gating or age assurances. And it, it's being seen as like, well, this, you know, there's this idea of like walled gardens that if, we'll, if we can construct these types of walled gardens that keep the bad actors out and the children's in, then, then the children will be safe. And there's something there for me that I wonder if there's this possibility of a reframe of, to provide a bit more context, I saw a presentation by um, David Souter at um, the Association of Internet Researchers conference last year in Dublin, and he is a UN advisor, and he had this little zinger of a, a statement saying that 
the issue of children, like I'm paraphrasing here, but like the issue of children online boils down to a tension between children's rights and adults' freedoms. And there's this idea that there's going to be these frictions between these two. And so we kind of take this approach for not just TikTok, but lots of platforms of like, well, if we just create like a walled garden and put the children in a pen and have all these safety things in, then it's fine. We're doing our job. And I just wonder if there's, you know, in reimagining a a future way that not just TikTok, but lots of platforms can operate of, you know, when we think about the values of what makes a platform safe for children to be in, are they not values or perspectives or ethics that we want more broadly for the internet? You know, like I also don't want to be seeing really harmful, violent content. I would love the platform to just like not have that, you know? And so it's, I think it's, I think it's a question around, I'd be so curious to know about those that in, in, within the trust and safety area of within TikTok, you know, what are the values that they're thinking about? And and is their perspective coming from like, how can we keep the children separate or off the platform? Or how can we reimagine it so that we have a platform that is safe for everyone, whether you're a child or an adult, um, to make sure that you have a really nourishing experience on the platform? Well, you asked us to dream big, so I'll, I'll take my answer in that direction. Um, I think, again, coming from the platform policy, like macro perspective on this, um, content moderation, every platform uh, sort of addresses or approaches the question of how transparent to be differently. Um, so you see places where like your your flag or your report goes into a black hole and you you never hear anything about it again, versus you see other platforms where you, you know, they sort of walk you through where it's at and they tell you the outcome in some ways too. Um, I think about like Wikipedia actually as a model for how sort of backstage debates can be transparent. Um, And not only that, um, those debates are transparent and the history and archive is preserved. So you see the back and forth discussions about um, whether things should stay, whether things should go, et cetera. And you have like open debate. Um, So, you know, content platforms could adopt like a more pluralistic model where you see space for like backstage discussion um, where like people could have objections to content moderation decisions. I, you know, obviously understand the challenges of all this stuff at scale Um, makes a ton of sense, but I think transparency around content moderation and, and again, preserving the archive could be a really interesting way of not just for users, but for researchers to understand how these policies are actually enacted and experienced by users. Thanks, Alex, Alicia, Andy. This is such a treat. We've got anything from communication strategy to parents and how effective that is outside of the insular people who really, really know about TikTok to thinking about whether we should be putting children in silos. Are values for children like values for all? That's something I'm going to be thinking about even on my way home. Thanks, Alicia, for putting that in our brains. And then from Alex, thinking about transparency, not just in terms of how the product was issued and formulated, but maybe transparency with stakeholders during the process of developing the product. These are all very interesting asks of the genie, and I would like to see how we can take this further. Without any further ado, I'm going to now transit to Q&A in our last few moments. So let's see what we have. All right, we've got a lot of questions coming up for you. Let me try and prioritize the ones I have here and then go on to the ones in my DM. In general, I have one here looking at the cultural context and the methodological context of your research. For all three of you, how do you try to incorporate children's perspectives and voices in your research? And similar to the discussion we had earlier, what is that tension between children's safety and agency? Whoever would like to go first. I'll just go really quickly, just so I know we don't have much time. I think I sort of briefly touched on this when I was talking about the walkthrough and observation thing. Um, That is how I've attempted to do it. I don't really have an answer as far as the policy end of things, um, because that is so macro and content analysis driven. But in terms of the identity and authenticity stuff, I've been able to incorporate in an ongoing project some like really direct engagement. 
thoughts, Alex? I, I consider, I actually consider um, the voices of the children to be something that that I or we, I guess, haven't paid um, um, kind of enough attention to, um, simply because, for example, with the Pandemic Parenting Project, per se, um, we focused on parents' views of those things, although we did consider in our analysis um, the, the discrepancy between parents and children and the fact that, you know, parents think of children's use of screen media in those particular ways. Um, and I do think that children's voices, particularly in relation to use of smartphones and tablets, which were considered so problematic in the eyes of the parents. Um, mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, the gaps between parental knowledge um, of what, uh, what the children were doing with these devices versus what children really thought they were doing and what they were learning from these kind of experiences were kind of, I assume, it can be quite stuck. So um, that's actually something we... Um, or my, myself as a researcher needs really to address. So thanks so much for that question, I think. And I'll just really quickly say that um, I haven't really done worked with children for TikTok specifically, but in the speculating about my digital future project where we're running workshops with seven and eight-year-olds asking about future technologies, um, I'm always blown away by the criticality uh, that, that young children have about the um, digital technologies and their use. And Something that constantly comes to mind, though, is that children are not some arbiter of truth. Like, the, it's not like there's some that they know something that we as adults don't know. However, I will say that children leave their mark on the world. And what do those markers tell us about the world um, and the ways in which children are picking up on things in ways that we may not be paying attention to in mm -hmm. those particular ways? That's the thing that I, I think there's so much value in listening to children's perspectives and incorporating and respecting those perspectives and also I think it's wild that adults just speak over the top of children uh, particularly when we see these moral panics in media when it's talking about you know think of the children it's like okay think of the children but also ask the children <laughs> that's a really good one thank you all three of you let me prioritize another one this is an interesting one out of all the misconceptions the general public has about TikTok and TikTokers who use it the most, which misconceptions do you find the most harmful or counterproductive and why? Feel free to answer this as a researcher, as an advocate for children or any other positionality. I think one of them um, would be, folks would really benefit from hearing that initial conversation, um, the fireside chat, because I think there is a misconception that there is not a lot of careful thought going into how to manage um, a safe and positive experience for children. Um, and there's plenty of evidence from not just from the folks we heard from, but also um, from community norms and practices that this is all very tricky, but folks are thinking of children in a really detailed and rigorous way. I think uh so I think just broadly there's this misconception like there's such a focus on the negatives of it and all the time I just feel like I'm telling people like how amazing TikTok is and I think it's so incredible that I can be lying in my bed and scrolling my phone and I'm I'm seeing the perspectives of people from all over the world that I would not have the opportunity to hear from or see um but what I want to say in the context of children is um, I find it really interesting that there is this, and I use the word trifecta of extreme risks of concerns. It's suicides, self-harm, and eating, EDs, eating disorders. And, and I say the word trifecta not to trivial, trivialize the seriousness of those issues and the ways in which they are present and that they do create harm. But I, I want to say the trifecta because the ways in which media reports concerns about not only TikTok but other social media platforms and youth is it they often center around these three things. Again, while those three things think while those three things are of concern, I think about that like there's a misconception of not paying attention to the other more not more, but the other types of harms and everyday types of harms. So for example, everyday forms of racism, misogyny, uh, the ways in which misinformation is presented. That there's all these other really like important issues that don't receive that critical attention uh, that ought to. Um, and yeah, I just kind of want to walk people back when they come from, yeah, that conversation of like, these are the issues. It's like, yes, they are issues. And there are also other issues that deserve attention as well. I just have a very big issue with the idea of addiction, which came up so much uh, in my research. 
on 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 parenting and 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 family media practices and in particular in relation to tiktok or, or more generally short short video forms because parents always say that oh we as adults can easily spend like two hours or three hours on these platforms without stopping so that's gonna <laughs> that's gonna be what's ha- gonna happen with the children so really kind of replicate what they experience or what they're doing with the platform to the children and the fact that they always think that if the children spends this amount of much um, amount of time it means that they're addicted to this platform and 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 that just um and it, because of that kind of idea they just they choose not to see all those things, specific things that children are doing with these platforms, you know, and the possibility that, for example, parents can spend time together with children on some of these platforms to really uh, benefit from it. And it came from some uh, some parents, but not all, or not the majority. So I think that that idea um, or that kind of discourse about um, um, addiction and, and and digital media or screen media in general is is really something I'm not that comfortable with, I guess. Um, so yeah. Thanks, Andy, Alex, Alicia. I want to put you on the spot again in one sentence. For the more junior scholars in the room, we've got a few PhD researchers I can recognize from our usual TCR and attendees. In one line. What would you say to someone who's wanting to start research on TikTok and children? Small question. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. One sentence. <laughs> start. I uh, have a sit down and a think. Are children the special interest group, or are you wanting to? Is there something else that you're wanting to study, and it's through the lens of children? So I really recommend before even doing any of the research, sitting down and having a really good think about what is it that you're wanting to know and are children aspect of it or are they a vehicle to look at that thing and are there other ways to look at it potentially? I think this is a question... my, my one sentence is something I think about with a lot of research, but I think it's particularly important for children because we're in a very different life stage. But I think it's important to engage with data as you're formulating your research questions. And in this case, meaning you should be like talking to and observing and engaging with children's media and consumption as you're thinking about your research question. Um, yeah, um, that's my one sentence. <laughs> Well, I would really love to ask this question to other people if I can. <laughs> but anyway, um, for me, I think I'll, uh, if this is actually a lesson I think that I learned from this, um, the project I've evolved in, and, and which is something that people have been talking about a lot, which is context matters. But I think what's behind this message is that it is important to consider context, but also it is challenging to consider context because it's so complicated and and people's use and understanding and experiences of TikTok and other forms of media platforms really vary across social economic status, you know, nationalities, ethnic uh, backgrounds, you know, cultural backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it is that kind of challenge, but also that kind of background that we as researchers, um, um, particularly, I guess, early career researchers really need to consider and, um, um, you know, consider seriously, I guess, um, in designing our research projects. So, yeah. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, Before I issue our panelists an official thank you, I want to acknowledge that Alex is joining us from New Orleans in the middle of the night. Thank you for making the effort with time zones. Andy has also just returned from the US. So thank you for joining us and still managing to sound so eloquent with what must be several levels of jet lag. We really do appreciate your commitment. That has been Singyu Andy Zhao from Deakin University, Alicia Rodriguez from QUT, Queensland University of Technology, as well as Alex Terry from Tulane. And thank you to our ECR panelists. We're now going to go on a 10 minute break before we open with our first session on children and care led by Dr. Jin Lee. So please stick around. We're gonna have the holding slide there, but we will see you sharp at 11 GMT plus eight.